right, so question three on the unit three, June 2019 paper for physics. Um, this question is about electron diffraction. So we can see on the diagram that we have an electron beam source that is emitting electrons. It goes through graphite. The graphite is acting as a diffraction grating. Um, and then we can see on the screen, we can see that we have this diffraction pattern um, as you can see in the diagram. Um, the first question is asking us to describe how the student can accurately determine the radius of the first bright ring. So the first bright ring will be um, this one that I'm going to mark here. So we're talking about this one. So we need to find the radius of that. Now, um, one way to do that is with the caliper, the one that you can see here, number one. Or what we can do, we can just put a paper on the screen and then mark with a pencil the points of the ring. We can, let's say, mark the two widest points on the paper and then use a ruler to measure the distance on the paper. Uh, or because it's a because it's a um, it's a curved screen, right? As you can see, it's a curved screen. We can use the flexible tape, which is the one you can see here, number two. So any of these ways, this is the the instrument and the way to measure it, either caliper ruler or the flexible tape. And since we're looking for the radius, therefore we cannot measure. It's kind of inaccurate to measure from the center. So it's better if we measure the, the diameter and then divide by two. Also, to make it more accurate, we need to measure from different orientations and then find, find the mean. We have to calculate the mean of these different orientations, always trying to measure from the widest point. And then, of course, we need to measure from the middle of the ring. So you can see if I, if I kind of uh, zoom in. So the ring has a specific thickness. So ideally, we should measure from the center of that ring, right? Not from the edge, not from the inner edge, the outer edge. The measurement should be taken from the center to the center on the other side. So then, uh, we are asking to find out how does the diffraction pattern provides evidence uh, for the wave nature of electrons. Now, diffraction, it's something that these, these patterns that we get, the dark rings and the, and, the, um, and the bright rings, it's something we get because we have interference of waves. All right, so this diffraction pattern is evidence for, for the interference. The bright rings is when we have constructive interference. The dark rings is when we have destructive interference. All right, and therefore interference is a property of waves, the same as diffraction. So both of diffraction and interference are properties of waves. So this is the evidence that the electrons are behaving as waves. The next part, uh, we're given some data so the student determined the radius of the first bright ring of the diffraction pattern for a range of electron energies. And then the student has calculated the De Broglie wavelength lambda of the electrons and the angle of diffraction theta. And you can see the results on the table. Then we need to criticize the results. Now, um, this is a very common question in the unit three paper, criticizing the results. And most of the things we have mentioned here are things that apply in in other questions right so first is that the the number of significant figures or decimal places for the wavelength is inconsistent you can see that some of them they have three decimals or two uh, sorry three significant figures or two decimals some of them they have one decimal two significant all right so this is considered to be consistency um, i have a, added here just a reminder about um significant figures so you can pause the video if you want and have a look at these examples just to remind yourself how do we what do we consider a significant figure and the next one is the range of the values 
it's a bit too small. So the range is the minimum, sorry, the maximum minus the minimum. You can see that the minimum is 1.9, the maximum is 3.47. So the range between these numbers is a bit small, right? So when we do experiments, we'll try to have as large range as possible. Then the third point is that there's no evidence for repetition. Um, again, just to improve the reliability of our investigation and our experiment, we we always try to repeat the the measurements and then get the get the mean. In that case, you can see that there's only one value for each for each uh, wavelength, right? For your different electron energies. So there's no evidence for repetition. And uh, the last one is that there's just five sets of results. So five is kind of the the minimum, all right? Usually we need to have um, a lot of results so we can be able to identify patterns. We have enough data to plot graphs and then from the graphs, of course, we see different trends. Then, then the next question is asking us to plot the graph of wavelength lambda on the y-axis and the sine of theta on the x-axis. So in order to do that, first of all, you have to calculate the results of sine theta, all right? Now, since our data, sorry, not this one. Uh, so since the data that we are given are of three significant figures, then the sine should be also three significant figures, right? So when you do this on the calculator, make sure you keep three significant. Then we need to plot the graph, we need to make the graph. Now, the points that are given in this question are one point, as I told you, for um, finding the sine theta values to three significant figures. Then, like in every other graph, we need to label the axis with the quantity and the unit. In that case, on the x-axis, there's just the quantity, there's no unit for sine theta. And next point is given for sensible scales so what do we mean by sensible scales first of all you have to make sure that you're using more than 50 percent of the space that you are given all right so the appropriate has to be an appropriate scale that will allow you to to use that amount of space that percentage of space then usually the scales we're using it's either times one times two times five and times ten these are the most popular ones. Avoid doing times three, times four, or times six, or anything else. All right. And then we're plotting the points. All right. Again, make sure when you put the dot or the cross, they are kind of small. All right. If you put like a huge dot like that, that covers more than half a square, then you're going to miss a point for that because something like that is not accurate so and then of course we have to plot the line of best fit right now you you can see that on the graph that I have I have plotted I started both axes from zero right so you can see also that the points are concentrated on that on that part of the graph now some students may decide to kind of start from a different number as you can see in this example over here and then you can see that our points are kind of spread out across the whole the whole paper the whole space that is given in that case i'm starting from different values All right so now you have to be a bit careful when do you start from zero when do you skip a few numbers and start from a different number you have to judge this based on the on the numbers you are given, right? So in that case, on sine theta, if I put everything into kind of a number line, so I start from zero, then the smallest value will be around um, 0 0.2, around that, a bit less than that. So if I say that this is 0 0.1, this is 0 0.2, this is 0 0.03, 0 0.4 and so on right um, these values here they lie on this area right so you can see that there's a huge gap before i start having values and then the range of my values is relatively small comparing to the gap 
So in that case, you can you know you can skip that part and then start your axis from somewhere there. All right. If it was a different case, if for example your values will have been in that range and the gap at the beginning is relatively small, then in that case it's better if you start from zero. So um, you can see the two graphs. All right, the gradient, the values for the gradient should be the same or very, very, very close to each other, no matter which one you decide to do. All right, and this will be the next, the next question. The next question will be asking you to find the gradient. So I have calculated the gradient for, for both, the one that started from zero and the one that starts from a different value. You can see that are very, very close to each other. All right. With the gradient, there's always going to be a small variation between students, right? So usually, the accepted values uh, are given as a as a range of values. It's not just one fixed value because every student might might plot the graph slightly differently, right? So you can see the values. Um, as I told you at the beginning, I'm just saving time on this video by just writing the answers in advance. You can pause the video and have a look and try to work out um, this uh, on your own. And the last question is that we need to explain why the spacing between the layers is given by the gradient of the graph. So the equation that we're using in that case, we need to kind of match it with the equation of the straight line. So we have plotted on the y-axis the wavelength, on the x-axis we have the sine theta. So if we match the terms of these two equations, you can see that, first of all, this is equal to zero because it goes through the origin. And then the gradient is equal to d over n, right? So since we're talking about the first string, then n equals one. Therefore, the gradient, if this is 1, the gradient would be d, which is the spacing between the layers.